Right. I am going to uh, start speaking uh, very slowly because uh, these things obviously take a little bit of time for people to log on. Um, and so I'm going to say uh, not very much for the first minute or so, just to ensure that people are, are there. Um, and I am going to welcome everyone to the second day of this conference um, from uh, from the uh, from, from from London from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Um, we have a, a panel this morning from nine until ten, uh, and the panel is the third panel of the session. It's called AI Law in Practice fit for purpose. Um, this panel uh, has three papers, uh, all of which will be um, 15 minutes. And then we have uh, uh, Dr. Peter Coe, who will be the discussant, who will be here for another 15 minutes. Uh, there'll be an opportunity uh, for questions to be asked from the floor. Um, please use the Q&A box for doing that, and we will feed them into the discussion. So the, uh, the papers are as follows. The first paper is Susan Bennett with AI Regulations, Frameworks and Standards. Uh, the second paper, which is co-authored between Dr. Maria Cristina Gaeta and Dr. Livia Orlino, is on autonomous vehicles uh, from HMI to liability issues in the context of smart cities. The third paper uh, is uh, by Professor, co-authored Professor Lucille Gatt and Professor Ilario Cagliano. Uh, and this paper is Methodological Evolution of Legal Area Research and the New Role of the Lawyer in the Transition Towards the Subjectivity of Generative AI Algorithms and the Measurement of Their Impact Risk. So those are our three papers this morning. Uh, just to repeat, much as I said right at the beginning for those who may have missed it, uh, each paper is 15 minutes and there is time for discussion uh, which will be led and moderated by our discussant Dr. Peter Coe uh, for the last 15 minutes of the session. Um, I think that is sufficient for us to all bed in. We're two minutes in already. Um, repeat the point again. If anyone's got any questions, observations, please feed them into the Q&A box um, and we uh, will uh, do our best to incorporate them into the discussion of this session. Okay, um, we've done a little check and everyone's mics are working and we can hear everyone. Can I suggest everyone, which they already have done, is if you're not speaking, mute your mics. Everyone has. I'm about to mute Mike and I will hand the floor over to Susan. Susan, please tell us about AI regulations, framework and standards. Thank you, Richard. So uh, hello, everyone from Sydney, Australia. Uh, I'm a, a practitioner and uh, also a researcher, and I'm looking at how to help organisations with this challenge of technology, data and regulatory compliance. So governance has been in the news this week, but my focus is on how um, organisations who are putting into service those buying AI systems and integrating them into their organisation and how they should um, be governing in light of the emerging regulations um, and also in relation to the plethora of uh, regulatory um, regulations and regulatory compliance challenges for boards and governing authorities. And by governing authorities, I mean government agencies as well. Um, so how do we align all of the policies and procedures that are relevant to AI technology? We often see you need an AI strategy, AI plan, AI policy and processes, but they don't sit alone. It's very much part of privacy, um, information security and data governance, which can be in separate silos within organisations and generally are. Um, and the responsibility for the uh, authority oversight of boards and governing authorities and the corporate governance challenge, which we've seen this week with um, ChatGPT. Um, so a survey uh, last year uh, done by the Bank of England and the FCA um, revealed that nearly three quarters of all UK financial firms already have in use or are developing machine learning. Um, and I think this is one of the things when we talk about it's being developed, um, many if not all, all large organisations have various forms of perhaps unsophisticated but increasingly sophisticated uh, AI systems that bring um, risks. Here in Australia, we had a survey done earlier this year of 300 Australian company directors and executives, and this identifies 
the main areas where AI systems are already in use or planning to be used in their organisation. So you can see there a lot of those are going to involve personal information, for example, customer service, marketing and sales, human resources, of course. Um, and I will mention at the end the AI class action in the US involving the Workday uh, technology system in that regard and product and service development. So from the regulatory challenge, um, we've seen um, with the GDPR um, and also particularly I can only speak to the UK and Australia in the financial services space, an increasing use of uh, what we call principles-based uh, regulations or risk-based um, approach, uh, which is very much uh, in the AI Act. Um, this sits in the context of the complex geopolitical issues, the AI um, arms race that's now on, um, which on the one hand uh, sees a slow development of AI regulation with a plethora of um, countrywide um, frameworks and standards around AI. Of course, EU has in place uh, harmonised standards and common specifications which are legally blinding and are also referred to in the AI Act. But from um, the organisational perspective and as a practitioner and as a uh, lawyer and compliance uh, focused person, um, frameworks and standards are not usually uh, legally binding unless they are included in a contract. So we see in tech contracts, ISO 27001 series often referred to NIST standards as well. Um, but unless they're actually in a contract, they are not legally binding. From the organisational perspective, um, there's a massive focus on uh, leveraging technology and data for strategic objectives. There's a plethora of regulations writ large in every aspect of the organisation. There's many standards that you can apply. Um, there are questions around who's responsible for implementing, overseeing and auditing of AI. I find it fascinating on large projects when you say who owns the system, IT is only responsible for putting it in, who owns the data and often it's, you know, you have senior executives who are calling for and driving for a system to be put in to say, well, I'm not responsible for the data. So these are fundamental problems um, that organisations are perhaps um, not dealing with or just beginning to grapple with or uh, looking to address these issues. The other issue is um, whether the organisations have all the skills to safely implement and oversee the AI technology. So already we know the general legal framework is the existing laws apart from the AI regulations around work health and safety, consumer protection, anti-discrimination and, of course, um, the director's duties are around the due care and diligence and good faith and proper purpose, which very much comes back to the risk management framework and uh, systems that the organisation has in place. So um, this is from the uh, European Commission's uh, paper on the AI Act, and we can see there the four levels of risk. So in my research work, um, we look at the regulatory pyramid developed by Ayers and Braithwaite and then further evolved with uh, Cogley, Nees and Mendelssohn, their regulatory discretion pyramid. And they put um, conventional regulations, which the prohibited unacceptable risks are an example of under the AI Act. And then they call um, the next level down meta-regulation and I've put there high risk, limited risk and minimal risk, and then self-regulation. So uh, meta-regulation, I like the term meta-regulation um, because to me it describes what the organisation needs to do, and that is they need to develop their own uh, laws, which are rules and policies, in order to comply with um, the objective of the meta-regulation. Um, so their definition is there um, and I've put underneath it that it requires organisations to create their own internal rules through policies and processes to meet regulatory goals. One of the things I find is that uh, people within organisations are looking for clear direction and they like 
prescriptive rules so they can say this is the requirement. And I think with uh, risk-based or what we call principle-based, um, it's very generic. And then even though when guidance is issued or common specifications or harmonised standards in the EU space, there's a lot of delving down. And often when you delve down, um, as I do to look at it, you still are required to develop your own rules and systems. So when we look at um, the Chapter 2 obligations, we see concepts of adequate risk assessment, um, high quality of data sets, appropriate human oversight. So I'm conscious of time, I've just set out a couple of examples. It says the risk management system um, shall be established and implemented. It does say it shall take into account um, state of the art, including relevant harmonised standards or common specifications. So again, you've it points to other things and those are binding in the EU, but in the broader global context, uh, often they're not. Um, appropriate data governance and management, uh, high risk human oversight includes it shall be ensured either by building it in, if it's technically feasible, or identified by the provider before placing the high risk system on the market or putting it into service and that are appropriate to be implemented by the user. So it's quite generic, as you can see. So if we look at the harmonised standards and the common specifications within the Act, um, they're, they're those six articles there. But the conformity assessment in particular draws attention to Directive 2013-36, which is the prudential supervision of credit institutions and investment firms. And this came out of the, what I call the global financial crisis we call here in Australia. I know everyone calls it something different. Um, but looking at that directive and the sections, Articles 97 to 101, they are just the risk assessment framework, the risk management framework, and the process that the that the financial institutions have in place. So again, whilst um, they they are commonly well known and well used, and there are regulations uh, issued that banks and financial firms have to comply with, again it comes back to this fundamental point about. Um, organisations have to develop their own rules and risk management uh, frameworks. So um, what I have been advocating and researching is whether information governance um, enables organisations to uh, move towards self-regulation to comply with their meta-regulatory requirements and the conventional uh, regulations. So it shifts the focus to the organisation to enhance its own self-regulation, to enable it to achieve its strategic objectives holistically, which is implementing data-driven technology, but enables compliance of both conventional meta-regulatory requirements together with um, other processes like ethical frameworks, third-party standards and other business requirements. So they have a holistic um, policy uh, procedure and process. Why is this an issue? Well, uh, as I said before, we've got three quarters of organisations from this survey, financial firms with um, AI or machine learning and planning or planning to use it. 80% of them have data governance. Um, just over 60% have model risk management, which they're required to do. Um, but only we get down to 60% are using principal guidelines and standards. And then this is an anomaly because it seems that only half either have enterprise-wide risk management um, processes or what I think is they're sitting, um, the AI systems sit separately, which is often what happens, and they're not being connected in the risk management is not being connected in properly to the enterprise-wide risk management. And that's an issue because it means there will be no auditing, which is reflected down here in this very low score of um, only just over 21%. And clearly auditing is a big issue, as is third-party risk management. So just um, in the couple of minutes I've got left, um, 
we've had, it's not only AI systems that are a problem, it's technology systems writ large. So we've just had a massive uh, Royal Commission here in Australia into a technology system. Um, but the most important thing I think that came out of the Royal Commission uh, was that it uncovered a cultural problem that did not um, rectify what was known to be uh, a fundamental flaw and an unlawful use and application of the technology to the legislation. Um, it also resulted in a $1.8 billion payout. You, uh, you in the UK have had the post office scandal. Again, software accounting. In both cases, people died. Um, and it took years in both cases for it to be uncovered, although the post office scandal is in a league of its own on that account. Our two biggest banks in Australia have had over billion dollar fines. Um, in my mind, whilst they were for failures to comply with anti-money laundering laws, um, were technology integration failures. And we now have class actions in the US. Uh, we have the um, class action I mentioned against Workday, which is globally used. And in the university I work at here in Sydney, uh, we use Workday and I use it. Um, and in uh, the other case I wanted to mention was the discrimination case in State Farm. State Farm, again, used um, two systems that are part of the statement of claim, Duck Creek, which is a um, insurance claim uh, process system, which relied on third party integrations to detect fraud and uh, structure claims for workflow uh, customers like uh, State Farm, and it partnered with Fris, um, which is a provider of AI risk and fraud detection claims. Those two systems are globally used. Uh, one of them is even used by a New South Wales government agency here. So um, going back to the AI framework, we need an AI governance framework. We need uh, accountability, um, alignment of relevant policies and processes. Importantly, it needs to be connected into the enterprise risk management framework. And critically, there needs to be uh, reporting up to the audit committee and board. Otherwise, the board does not get the proper oversight. Um, in organisations, um, the alignment of policies and processes usually sits in a silo and this needs to be aligned and people who are working on AI projects or working on a data impact assessment need to understand what the record keeping obligations are and need to be able to, um, and the data governance and need to be able to access and understand those and you need an overarching um, governance uh, mechanism. So um, in conclusion, in summary, AI governance, we need appropriate design and implementation of risk management systems um, for the AI system, uh, but it needs to align with all other relevant policies and processes, including record keeping, cyber privacy, and I've included ESG because every aspect of um, data and particularly AI systems um, impact carbon footprint in E, social, ethical use of data and governance as in how you're um, organising these. So these are going to be really big issues going forward. And I um, am researching and advocate whether we can um, integrate our information and data and technology into um, an enterprise-wide um, system of a governance so it can connect formally to the enterprise risk management framework and enable um, not only organisational objectives to be achieved, but ensure that we've got good regulatory compliance, meta-regulatory compliance and effective self-governance. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. That was not an easy task, 15 minutes to give an overview of the uh the um, AI regulatory landscape. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm taken aback. And also, I don't know what time it is there, but obviously you are staying up late. Thank you very much. Lots of very interesting uh, food for thought and you scoped out the area um, uh, very clearly for all of us. So I think we'll turn now to the second um, uh, paper if we can, and this is concentrating on autonomous vehicles uh, and looking about liability issues. Uh, and um, we've got Maria, Dr. Maria Christina Cleta and Dr. Livia Orlino. I will hand the floor over to one of those. Good morning to everybody and 
This search is the result of two research on autonomous vehicle where I have defined the issues related to the human machine interface, while Dr. Gaeta defined the liability issues in the context of, the, of smart city. Just to understand what uh, is meant by autonomous driving, the CIE has published international standards that have defined the six level of automation from zero to partial to level five of uh, total automation. We currently have a level, a level three uh, third in um, circulation where the vehicle can perform the driving function, but the driver must always be ready to take the, dog, the control. The subject of my studies uh, is uh, the legal language, in particular the relationship between language and law, the relationship between law and autonomous driving, precisely how legal information is provided by interface in autonomous vehicles, and the legal design methodology. Uh, in addition, the project required as a final task the study of human-machine interaction and the creation of an interface in autonomous driving that communicates some legal information with a design uh, that would favor the understanding of the user. And I have proposed a new interface, a privacy disclaimer with the legal design methodology. Uh, several research methodologies have, have been adopted to answer to the case study. Traditional research methodology of positive law, benchmark methodology, mixed methods that include quantitative and qualitative research on a different sample of user, and finally the legal design methodology. Uh, what is legal design is the application of uh, human centered design to the world of law to create a clearer and understandable legal service for the user. This methodology is based on the principles of uh, transparency, clarity, and openness of information. And it also plays an important role in the design of software and human machine interface. Uh, the methodology consists of five phases, discover, uh, definition, ideation, testing, and verification. Going into more details about the issue, we focus on uh, advances driver assistance system. Uh, the scope is to facilitate the driving in emergency situation. And this system communicates the legal information through visual and sonar device. Uh, several specific cases were analyzed using the benchmarking technique. And uh, the importance of providing information in a clear, transparent way to the consumer is also established by the Articles uh, 21 and 22 of Italian Consumer Code. Uh, specific research has been conducted to propose a privacy disclaimer to be styled inside autonomous vehicle designed according to the methodology of legal design. In particular, uh, the privacy disclaimer has been designed to five phases typical of the legal design methodology. Uh, but how does the, the privacy disclaimer work? Uh, first of all, I, assume, I have assumed the possibility of a login with a personal account, so that if the vehicle is used by um, several people, the information will be shared once for each user. Once the vehicle is turned on, the privacy disclaimer will appear, with, uh, which will contain the privacy policy consisting mainly of icons. On the, other, on the one hand, there is information on how data uh, is processed, and on the other hand, uh, what are the rights of the driver. If you do pin, um, you can click the single icon and you will, uh, you will open the, the opening. In conclusion of my first part, uh, we can say that the success of the future automation systems will depend on the ability um, to create a solid human machine team, and so with the quality of interaction, communication, and cooperation. And so the legal design must intervene in the design of systems that provide the legal information as an ex-ante remedy, just to make the user aware what they are doing. Um, as a second part of our presentation, I would like to focus on the liability issues in the context of a smart city, 
with particular regard to self-driving cars. I am particularly happy to, to see that our presentation is in line with that of Susan. And uh, so um, just uh, let me give the, the context of the, the presentation. Um, we uh, are focusing our research of, uh, on smart cities with particular regard to mobility. And uh, the, the, the kind of mobility we are analyzing more in details are self-driving cars. Um, in this context, uh, uh, the, the starting point of the research is the, the measurement of the impact of AI. And this because um, uh, in order to regulate new technologies, uh, it's important to uh, analyze the benefits, but more, uh, with more attention, the risks. And this is also the European approach. But before the European approach, in Italy, in 2020, the Agency for Digital Italy already published its white paper. And the challenge eight of this paper was the measurement of the impact of the use of artificial intelligence, even though applied to the public sector. But of course, this approach can be also used for the private one. And the, the approach of the measurement was uh, uh, depend uh, thanks to two different perspectives. The first one was the protection of the citizen. It means the individual. And the second one is the, the protection of the institution or applied to the private sector, to the, uh, the companies, the business activity. And the purpose of this uh, challenge is measuring the impact of AI technologies in order to guarantee the AI risk management that was already uh, analyzed in, the, in uh, the previous presentation. So Italy already uh, understood the, import the importance of the measuring approach in 2020. Uh, this approach is clear also at European level and uh, the AI Act proposal of 2022 and also the last version of June 2023 is focused on the measurement of the impact of AI according to the risk-based approach, prohibited, high risk, low risk. Um, and uh, the, key, the key point of this uh, approach is the, are the foundation model, of course, because the new kind of AI is based on foundation model and is important to reduce the negative impact of AI. Uh, the only possibility to reduce the uh, negative impact of AI is a correct regulation because technology cannot be stopped but can be properly regulation under a double approach, ex-ante approach, uh, it means preventive approach, and uh, exposed approach, it means remedial approach. This kind of approach with regard to ex-ante protection, uh, it be is based on legal and ethical compliance. I legal and ethical compliance in the last year um, is being developed under the uh, in compliance with the according to ESG factor. It means the protection of the environment to which the individuals belong, the protection of the, the society, so social, and in general, a, a great governance. Uh, in this way, it's possible to guarantee a comprehensive uh, protection uh, example, uh, taking into account all the aspects from the uh, the environment, the climate, the, the climate change, the social aspect, the uh, the, U, the health and safety, the human rights uh, in this in this era, ethics is very relevant. And governance, it means compliance in the public and in the private sector, in order to guarantee high standard of protection for the individuals that interact with new technologies. Uh, before to, to move on the exposed protection, it's important to uh, verify the, um, the types of injuries that can be uh, configured, that can occur in case of AI use. Uh, according to our analysis, the main risks that can arise from the use of AI are the following. First of all, the security. 
the security intended as physical and psychological injury that can occur of the AI system or to the third parties, as well as the physical damages of the user of the AI system uh, and in general the uh, surrounding environment. The kind of uh, regulation that it's currently in force is, of course, Product Liability Directive uh, and in Italy, the Italian Consumer Code. As we know, uh, Product Liability Directive is under revision and maybe a more uh, a comprehensive regulation will be published taking into account smart uh, things as the the current regulation of 1985 maybe is not uh, updated to the, the digital age. The second kind of injury is the cybersecurity. Cybersecurity uh, is a, a wide category that also includes privacy because a cybersecurity breach can also impl imply a data breach. Uh, currently, cybersecurity is regulated uh, by ENISA or with two uh, European directives, NIS 1 and NIS 2. Concerning privacy issues, GDPR is one of the most debated topics. Uh, and uh, uh, here the problem is the unlawful processing of personal data, for example, in case of data breach for uh, uh, cyber attacks. Ethical issues are also very important in, uh, in the domain of AI application, from emotional bounds to physical manipulation to discrimination. In this field, there is not soft, uh, hard law in, uh, in force, but uh, the importance of soft law is very high, in particular, for example, with regard to the codes of conduct that are provided by GDPR, but will be provided also by the AI Act. And finally, the environment, the environment to which all the individuals belong. So protect the environment means protect the health, of the individuals, the life of the individuals, the, uh, the well-being of the individuals. In the perspective of liability, the regulation that we have at European level for uh, liability for environmental damages is quite ancient, so uh, it also needs to be uh, amended. To complete the regulation that is now in process at the European level, we have uh, AI Act proposal, but also the Artificial Intelligence Liability proposal with a very important harmonizing rule. So uh, according to this kind of uh, injury, two types of liability can be put on the table. First of all, the liability for physical damage to the AI system or the surrounding environment and the liability for psychophysical damage to the user, with particular regard to the cases of, for example, unlawful processing of personal data, personal injury, or physical manipulation. This kind of injury can be applied to the case of self-driving cars, because self-driving cars work thanks to data, uh, that can be unlawful processed. Uh, self-driving cars can... Uh, uh, drive on, uh, on, on the road and can uh, cause an accident. So it's important to define the applicable regulation. Until now, we don't have regulation for self-driving cars in Italy. So we are applying the existing regulation uh, um, also to the, the new scenarios that are now uh, evolving. Uh, for, for example, semi-autonomous vehicle, the liability could be of the driver, the owner or the manufacturer. Uh, it depends on the thesis and the approach that is, uh, is preferred. When we arrive to autonomous vehicle, uh, the driver is not in place as uh, there is no driver to driving a self-driving car. So the liable person could be the owner for the only fact that he bought the vehicle according to the deep pocket approach or the manufacturer because uh, of uh, he produ uh, has produced a vehicle with uh, a defect. So um, what is important is uh, to balance the technological innovation with the environmental protection uh, in order to guarantee uh, an adequate regulation of the phenomena and provide uh, specific liabilities uh, uh, rules 
that of course should be amended because they uh, does not take into account do not take into account the the digital age what kind of regulation we uh, could mean for an effective protection of course uh, a multi level regulation at least european regulation because technology cannot be regulated according to national legislation and of course with a look to the international uh, legislation for harmonization purposes and the content of regulation should be a uh, private law regulation uh, based on an exempte and uh, exposed protection in terms of sustainability and this is the direction of the AI Act proposal and the aim of the regulation is to guarantee uh, the right balance between sustainability and technological development. Another big question is related to the, the domain of uh, the regulation. If it's possible to provide only a general law uh, for AI or not. According to our study, uh, it's important to regulate AI application according to its characteristics. It means that it's not possible to provide a general regulation for AI, but a general framework like AI proposal. But the same AI Act proposal divide the AI according to the risks. So it is the same AI uh, Act proposal to require for specific regulation of some kind of AI technologies, as for example, uh, self-driving cars. So let me conclude uh, with uh, our first remarks. The technological development cannot be stopped, but uh, it must be properly regulated in order to be placed at the service of the human being, uh, balancing innovation with the need of sustainable development. The law has the objective to regulate also a uh, private relationship between different legal effectiveness and uh, types that aim to answer more sustainable company in line with the ESG factor uh, to guarantee a protection of the individual and of the environment. Uh, we stop here our presentation and we thank you for the attention. I will now turn to the last, third and last paper, Professor Gatt and Professor Cagliano. Um, please, uh, would you like to take the floor and tell us about um, your paper, Methodological Evaluation, Evolution of Legal Area Research and the New Role of the Lawyer in the Transition Towards the Subjectivity of Generative AI Algorithms and the Measurement of Their Impact Risk. So, um, I would like to thank you, um, Laura, for inviting me to speak uh, uh, to come to speak here today and uh, congrats for this important conference. Um, the subject uh, about which uh, uh, me and Professor Caggiano are um, talking about is um, already um, treated by the um, speakers that uh, have uh, talked before, uh, but we try to um, approach the subject from different point of view. Uh, so um, the first point that I would like to focus is uh, uh, the methodological evolution of legal research and the new role of the lawyers uh, regarding um, the problem of uh, uh, the measuring of the risk of impact of uh, generative AI. Um, most of all, we... Um, the interaction between law and technologies, uh, most of all, uh, the interaction between an, um, the development of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, has led the uh, development of legal area research in two new directions. Um, that of the transition uh, to apply research that makes the hybridization of humanistic scientific knowledge effective and that of the so-called measurement of the ethical legal compliance of uh, technologies, in particular uh, um, technologies um, with AI uh, equipped, generative AI equipped. Uh, so the problem that the uh, juries at most of all academics um, uh, have to fix in the face of the, the technologies is no longer consist only in the interpretation of existing norms in order to make them applicable 
or in the creation of new norms that expressly provide for them. In other words, um, the possible relationship between legal research and the generative AI development, the technologies development, is uh, uh, the following. Uh, we can uh, we can see um, um, some of the uh, possible relationship between legal research and uh, technology development. Um, the most, um, the first and the second A and B uh, are um, probably uh, the new, um, the, the most, the most uh, um, known and uh, um, simple to understand, uh, because uh, lawyers um, obviously um, must to um, to read and to uh, give interpretation uh, to the um, norms and rules and so on. And in other cases, they have to create new legal categories, uh, but. But the, um, the most important uh, uh, relation um, is going to develop in, in this time at the moment is the, the third um, and uh, in, in regarding the uh, identifying process in, and tools for implementing uh, a good AI, uh, academics, uh, jurists uh, must uh, have uh, a new uh, important role because uh, um, uh, there is a um, because uh, they have to uh, to design, uh, they have to take part to uh, product uh, process um, in order to design uh, new technologies. Um, from an ethics uh, point of view, uh, but also um, they uh, have um, they have jurists have to develop uh, competence uh, in the field of privacy and the security by design. Uh, so um, going on to this uh, um, second uh, representation of the uh, activity activities that juries have to do uh, now, interpretation and uh, legal uh, creativity, um, 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 legal creativity are very important to uh, imagine the legal problems that might arise from implementation and dissemination uh, generative AI. Uh, but uh, um, an, an example, an example of this, uh, uh, this important role uh, is the question that uh, Maria Cristina has very well um, illustrated uh, about uh, the damages produced to humans and the environment by the autonomous uh, agents, uh, for example, autonomous vehicle. Uh, the problem of the um, re um, re identifying um, um, to the responsible, who is the who is responsible of these damages of these arms? Um, as Maria Cristina has already said, in uh, um, European at European Union level, uh, we have two uh, important proposal directive proposal, um, but uh, both directive uh, propose um, traditional responsibility model, traditional liability model. Uh, the first one uh, is about a traditional product liability model, and the second one uh, propose a generic artificial intelligence liability damage model configured on the fault based liability model, um, the model that we can find now in all legal system at European and not European level. Uh, but probably in uh, uh, at academics level and in other legal system, we can find um, other um, proposal, other proposal um, um, more original. Uh, for example, uh, in Saudi Arabia and in other um, part of uh, the world, um, there is the proposal to uh, give uh, a legal personality. To, uh, to autonomous agents. And uh, this is um, a very interesting point because um, probably thinking in this way, uh, the traditional category of uh, uh, liability um, in tort and in contract law, probably, um, probably they have um, submitted to a, a very uh, deep um, 
revolution uh, anyway um, let's go on to the um, to the second to the third point uh, the possible relationship between legal research and uh, technology development the point c um, of the list uh, before illustrated uh, so um, juries um, um, probably uh, in at this moment uh, they um, have been called to a, um, a very new role uh, because um, um, they have to uh, identify processes and tools for trustworthy generative AI. Uh, in other words, they uh, are involved uh, in decision-making processes on generative AI development. Why? Because um, as uh, the first speaker had said, um, uh, artificial intelligence act uh, proposal at european level has uh, adopted a risk based approach uh, already illustrated uh, and this risk based approach um, is not uh, adopt adopted uh, just uh, only at european level but uh, um, we can find this uh, approach um, that we can um, we can name um, FRIA, a fundamental in rights uh, impact assessment. Uh, this approach is uh, adopted by um, Bletchley Declaration, um, November uh, 2023, but also in Executive Order 2023 and Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights 2022 in USA. In other words, at this moment, we have three different uh, regulatory acts um, that have uh, together um, adopt a freer perspective, a freer perspective. Uh, in other words, um, in uh, UK, uh, in U USA and in Europe, uh, we uh, can see that uh, um, governments at the side uh, to um, to say that uh, um, AI uh, regulation uh, needs uh, a freer approach. Uh, and uh, um, more, um, we have to remember that uh, 12 September 2023, um, an important uh, hub uh, in Europe, Brussels Privacy Hub, um, has um, launched an appeal to approve a fundamental rights impact assessment in the EU law on artificial intelligence and uh, 150 academics uh, as, uh, um, have, uh, um, have subscribed this, uh, this letter. Uh, one of them is uh, our Professor Lloyden. And uh, um, there, there is more, there is more because um, one of the amendments proposed by Parliament um, for modifying uh, the uh, AI Act um, com Commission proposal is the uh, Amendment uh, 415. Uh, this amendment uh, introduced uh, some words, some very important words, because uh, um, the paragraph uh, seven of the article 30 um, has been amended, as you can see, uh, um, where applicable com com um, in this article um, um, is established that uh, um, an important uh, notifying authority at national and European level um, must uh, must um, uh, exercise a, a lot of activities um, regarding the FRIA approach, uh, and it's very important. Um, no, um, very important to underline that this notifying authority shall have a sufficient number of competent personnel, and. Um, this uh, this person this expert uh, are um, juries are um, they must have uh, necessary expertise um, such as a degree in an appropriate legal field so uh, it's very important uh, to uh, understand that now uh, the, the um, lawyers are officially in the um, bodies uh, notifying authority where 
um, it will be decided about uh, um, the possibility for an artificial intelligence technologies to put in the market. In fact, the FRIA approach uh, try to uh, give answers to some important questions. Um, uh, how to measure the risk of harmful impact of the intelligent product in an ex-ante phase? Uh, who, perform, who performs the impact risk measurement uh, and who verifies it? Uh, what are the consequences of measuring the impact risk of the intelligent product? Uh, to all these questions, we can give a lot of uh, po uh, possible answers. And uh, one of the most important is uh, to uh, to um, focus uh, the um, the standards, the common standards um, uh, of time, uh, common standards of evaluation, measurement, parameters, and the criteria. One of them, very important, is the uh, sustainability criteria, about which uh, uh, my colleague uh, will say um, will say uh, uh, more. Uh, so uh, at the time, um, so now I would like to say also that uh, a very important possibility is to uh, create an automation um, in the evaluation process of uh, um, impact assessment. And uh, um, the Commission, uh, European Commission, has already proposed one of them uh, named Altai Tool. Uh, and uh, using this uh, uh, tool is possible to create uh, um, a diagram or um, a measurement of uh, seven parameters um, in, um, and uh, in order to understand if the um, risk, the impact risk of the new technology is high, uh, medium, low or, um, or unacceptable. Uh, so uh, my uh, presentation is over. I, uh, without delaying more, I will give the floor to my colleague uh, Ilaria Caggiano. So um, I'm going to just uh, in this uh, in this part discuss. Thank you again all for the organization, but uh, I want just to focus uh, on uh, some uh, small aspects of uh, what has already been said on uh, the need of an impact assessment of AI and generative AI. So my, uh, my, my part of present my, uh, this part of the presentation is uh, basically on the sustainability impact assessment and the need of a comprehensive and reliable sustainability impact assessment of AI and generative AI. Having in mind the role uh, that lawyers uh, in the next year have to play and also legal scholars have to play, as been already said. So just to be brief on this part, uh, there's uh, an, a growing uh, uh, awareness uh, on the on, a, on the problem of uh, AI energy consumption. And here I have just uh, taken some data from a recent Italian study where it is possible to compare the, the amount of CO2 emissions um, of uh, like uh, one year uh, human life uh, with uh, some uh, a single session of uh, training uh, of uh, uh, NLP neural architecture or other transformer training. Uh, um, however, we need to consider that uh, although there is uh, obviously uh, this uh, uh, consideration of the consumption, energy cons consumption uh, of, um, of AI, at the same time, we need to consider that developing AI, we could develop also more efficient uh, um, uh, system of uh, energy cons consumption and so optimize uh, energy efficiency uh, in uh, in a number of sectors. So uh, in, th in this first part, I want to point out that it's important to consider in any uh, impact assessment, the short term and the medium and long term when we consider the development of AI. Uh, these, uh, uh, I would say, these two aspects were, uh, uh, have been considered by the European regulator. Uh, they were considered by the Commission when in 2021 uh, was uh, issued 
the, the first proposal, AI proposal, uh, environment was considered uh, five times. So the word environment and sustainability um, appeared um, at and appear uh, five times uh, in the test. Uh, but more awareness, uh, um, more uh, much stronger awareness um, is uh, in the in uh, in the consideration of the European Parliament. So according to the amendments that were be, were made by the European Parliament in June two thousand twenty three, uh, there 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 has been an increasing attention to environment in different parts. So uh, I want just to be uh, very very short uh, in uh, classifying the, the the role of environment uh, uh, in, uh, in the regulation of AI. Uh, so apart from the general consideration of the um, about the consistency uh, of uh, uh, standards with the European um, standard, environmental standard of AI uh, with the European Green Deal and the general provisions uh, about the need to uh, to uh, uh, to quantify the energy cons uh, consumption of any AI system, there has been and the technical documentation that has to consider energy consumption uh, in the entire life cycle of any AI system. There's a particular consideration on generative foundation mm -hmm. models, uh, so uh, so foundation model or generative generative AI, and also um, if we consider the uh, high risk AI system, mm -hmm. I'm just uh, considering. Uh, the only the consider the the recital of uh, of the proposal but as uh, you will see uh, there are an, in, uh, an, an equal amount of uh, um, of of uh, quotation of citation of environment in the articles so in order to assess if an ai system has can be considered high risk ai system uh, for uh, uh, the list of Annex 3, um, any provider has to consider if uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, AI system has an impact uh, as a high risk um, and play, so a high risk impact on environment. So it's a, a, a tool to qualify and to assess the uh, high risk um, quality of an AI system. There's a final point um, I want to point out, and that and and it is that um, the European Parliament considers that uh, there's a need of uh, um, equal standards and good standards for measuring uh, the impact, the environmental impact. And But this is left to uh, the Commission, as you can see uh, in, uh, in the final recital, where the Commission is entitled to develop a methodology to contribute towards uh, KPIs and sustainable development development goals. The same uh, aspects, although uh, in a, a more uh, obviously a normative way and more specific way, are considered in the in the articles where uh, foundation model models are separate separate separately consider measuring environmental impact is uh, um, is uh, a specific uh, is uh, is devoted to a specific article and the same for high risk ai system just shifting and just a couple of minutes on the role this is uh, what is going to be uh, we'll see in the trilogues of the ai AI Act, how this will be developed, and the the the, the further um, the, the further acts of the Commission, and this this will be probably uh, the work that lawyers have to do. Now, just the idea to have uh, a more comprehensive uh, dimension of uh, impact assessment and sustainability impact assessment, which consider hold the um, United Nations goals. Very much indeed. Um, I think what we've just proven is that this is a huge amount of a huge area and we've got a lot of uh, material to cover. Peter, I don't know if you're still here. I know you had to catch a train. Um, I was going to give you a, uh, you know, 
10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. Uh, to, to, to <laughs> but, give us the answer. Peter, but, is it fit but, for purpose? Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I've got to go and catch a train in a moment. I'm going to have to shoot off. But just to say, I thoroughly enjoyed all three papers. Um, I was saying to Nora just a moment ago on the on the text that I'm going to um, – I've got some comments. Uh, I will send them to the panellists. I'm coming at this very much as a as a lay person, actually. Um, you know, I'm a media lawyer, so this 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 will. What what fascinates me about this is that these are issues that are so important because they will permeate every aspect of our lives. And I think we've seen this today. You know, it's it's going to permeate things like you know driving, the design of cities, our education, journalism, banking, which scares the hell out of me, if I'm honest. Uh, and I've got I've got comments about that as well. But I think this is something that we need to get grip. We need to get a grip with. Um, sorry, we need to get a grip of rather. We need to work out how we're going to tackle. It's not just at national and state level, but I think one of the the things that was coming across to me today is how we tackle this on a kind of a supranational level. How states work together to work out, you know, how we are going to safely implement AI and use it, because quite clearly it has could have huge benefits for our lives but there's with that of course um the uh, the challenges challenges as well so i'm really sorry that was an incredibly quick summing up i do have comments um i will get in touch with all the panelists next week with those comments but just again to say thank you so much i have thoroughly enjoyed all three of them uh, and I'm sorry, uh, this has been uh, a very quick discussion from me. <laughs> um, now Thank we're going to start uh, with the slides like delay uh, the, the next panel, which uh, I'll be uh, um, hosting. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure today to ask the panel on, a, on the EU AI Act and related EU frameworks. So today we're going to have two papers that will be discussed. Uh, unfortunately, um, our third panelists could not make it today due to personal circumstances, but I'm happy to uh, let you know that our two panelists, Dr. Jonathan Obar and uh, Dr. Gaia Fiorinelli, will be presenting today. Um, Dr. Jonathan Obar is an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Media Studies at York University in Canada, and Dr. Gaia Fiorinelli is... Um, is a research fellow in criminal law at Santana School of Advanced Study in Pisa, Italy. Uh, our discussion today will be Judith Tonant. Uh, she's a reader in digital society and justice at the University of Sussex. Uh, in terms of timing, so each uh, panelist will have 20 minutes uh, to present their paper. Uh, after the presentation uh, or discussion, Dr. Tonen will take the floor for some comments, to which the panelists will have the opportunity to reply, and then we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. So please feel free to use the Q&A box uh, to ask any question. And without uh, further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Obar, who will be presenting a paper entitled Meaningful Transparency and AI Governance, an Assessment of the EU AI Act. So please, Dr. Obar, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'll do my best to be uh, clear. It's a, a little bit early here, but uh, very excited to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers, to Eliza and to Nora uh, for organizing this and to all of you for your interest. I'm going to start by sharing um, in the chat a link to... Uh, my knowledge mobilization website, which I hope you'll have a look at as I'm talking, if interested, or afterwards, I'm going to share my screen as well, too. Uh, my name is Jonathan Obar. I'm an associate professor at York University in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I should start by noting that some of this work is funded by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. So it's important to note that the views that I'll express are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the funder. Policymakers internationally are championing AI transparency. In Canada, the federal government lists be transparent and provide meaningful explanations as the second and third guiding principles to ensure the effective and ethical use of AI. Uh, and this is in government services primarily. In the commercial sector, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada recommends that AI governance must emphasize transparency as well as a right to meaningful explanation. In the US, The White House has what they call the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights and includes notice and explanation as the fourth of five principles. The blueprint states, as noted on the slide, 
you should know that an AI is being used and understand how and why it contributes to outcomes that impact you. In June 2023, a statement pertaining to generative AI was put online following a meeting of the data protection and privacy authorities from the G7 and lists transparency measures to promote openness and explainability as one of eight key areas of concern. And of course, the focus for today, the EU AI Act, also includes multiple sections on transparency, uses the term explainability, which I'll be talking about today. So why transparency? A long-standing literature that certainly predates AI um, and these types of discussions suggests that access to use useful and usable information can enhance auditability and accountability where there is potential for corruption. Transparency can support digital literacy development amongst different publics to reduce information and control asymmetries um, between digital service providers and AI practitioners, and may even, as Professor Helen Kennedy and Dr. Giles Moss suggest, democratize data power. But they go on to say that we must produce conditions in which the public can act with greater agency. Meaningful transparency by organizations may be just one way to do that. Now, calling for transparency is one thing. Delivering on these calls is another. So I should mention, again, I've posted a link in the chat to a project that I've been working on for a number of years now, funded by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Um, my talk today is an extension of this work, my meaningful consent work, right? Notice and consent linked together, where I work to unpack an internet meme called the biggest lie on the internet. It's an internet meme, right? I unpack this meme. Um, I agree to the terms and conditions referred to as the biggest lie on the internet. Now, the first component of this meme, which is worth uh, discussing for a moment, is the notion of the lie. And I can tell you I've debated with many legal scholars about whether uh, clicking I agree to the terms and conditions without reading anything is a lie or not. Um, memes are imperfect, but they do still point to things that perhaps are quite important, like policy failure associated with the fair information practice principles. The point is, how can it be truthful if you're agreeing to service terms without accessing, reading, or understanding them? The lie is the biggest due to the omnipresence and ubiquity of digital services we are engaging all the time and, and you know, terms of service we're agreeing to all the time. So I should just note, if you're teaching about notice and consent in your classes, especially if you're teaching about click wraps, I hope you'll check out biggestlieonline.com. This is a knowledge mobilization website my team launched, as I said, with funding from the Privacy Commissioner here in Canada, meant to engage stakeholders in my meaningful online consent research and increasingly my AI transparency research. My work attempts to unpack this policy failure that the biggest lie on the internet suggests. So what's the policy failure? Governments that make policy based on these fair information practice principles, principles excuse me, require that companies be transparent about their data practices to help support meaningful consent processes, and associated information protections. Being transparent, providing people with notice, puts them on the front lines of their own information protections. Transparency in the AI context means providing people with information about data collection, data used in the development of AI, um, and increasingly how automated systems work, right? How they're developed and how they worked and how they're used by organizations to make decisions and to find answers to their varied questions. But does anyone read notice materials like privacy policies, right? Um, does anyone even access them, let alone understand them? As a result, we're not really realizing the data and information protections associated with meaningful transparency and consent. This is especially problematic as AI and algorithmic processes become further complicated and integrated into so many of the societal systems that were being described on the last panel. Meaningful transparency, right? The, uh, uh, the uh, primary focus of my presentation today suggests that providing information that goes beyond just notifying people is important, right? Um, it's important that we, when we are being transparent, that we're also working towards engagement and understanding about data being collected, about automated systems that are being de developed and how they might be used. Again, meaningful transparency suggests that information provided can help people understand the benefits and risks of AI and what could happen if you click agree, especially without reading. So in today's talk, I'll discuss two provisions in the EU AI Act that may support more meaningful transparency. And as a result, 
may help deliver those information protections associated with meaningful consent processes. Perhaps meaningful transparency, if ever realized, can help solve this policy failure that I've been talking about associated with the biggest lie on the internet. So let's talk about two sections of the EU AI Act. And I'll mention in what follows in the rest of the presentation, I'll critique two sections of the AI Act by referring to some of our empirical research that we've done. And you can find more information on our website. And then I'm gonna close with um, some potential solutions linked to a new Privacy uh, uh, Office of Canada, or sorry, excuse me, Privacy Commissioner of Canada study um, about uh, video-based notices. So section 47 uh, of the EU AI Act, referred to as the transparency section, notes this, to address the opacity that may make certain AI systems too complex, high-risk AI systems should include concise and clear language about risks to fundamental rights and discrimination. And I should pause just for a second and note um, that the use of the language high risk AI systems while not necessarily related to the transparency discussion today is something that I hope that um, AI scholars and legal scholars in particular are really focusing on. We're focusing a, a lot on, on this in Canada. Um, the, you know, the suggestion that only entities involved in the, in the use and the development of high risk systems should care about transparency and engage in transparency is highly problematic. This assumes that harms can only come from high risk systems. But as we've been arguing here in Canada in response to our own AI legislation, the, co the uh, combination of multiple so, uh, so called low risk AI analyses could actually lead to a cumulative effect that's perhaps more relevant and concerning than what a high risk, so called high risk system might create. And so this is something to consider further. And who gets to define, anyways, what's high risk and what's low risk when we're talking about? the communities most likely to be affected and harmed by AI, as the literature suggests, marginalized and vulnerable communities, quite a concern, certainly. So this particular section talks about providing concise and clear information to try and address all of this. And that's what would make transparency meaningful. And so we ask in our research, is the self-regulation delivering? So here's some data from uh, a report that's posted on biggestlyonline.com where we looked at 70 digital services, looked at their terms of service and privacy policies to see how long they are and how complicated they are, right? So I know this is a very busy slide, but really that's what we're looking at um, for uh, a, uh, a group of, of these 70, right? You see on the left there, uh, the companies in this table, Share It, Airbnb, Spotify, Uber, WhatsApp, Wish, Amazon, iTunes, Netflix, and Bitmoji popular apps. Um, and so what I want to focus on here is what's highlighted there in the middle, what's called the terms of service grade level. And then on the end, you see there on the right, the privacy policy grade level. What we did is we collected the privacy policies in terms of service from these companies, and then we assessed how complicated they are. We used something called the flesh Kincaid grade score analysis. What this essentially does, it is allows you to uh, analyze the complexity of nonfiction texts to give like a, a, a grade level analysis. This is based on uh, the American you know, um, schooling system. So if you get like a 10, this is like being in grade 10 and having a grade 10, or excuse me, having a grade 10 level um, reading complexity, right? You need a grade 10 level education uh, to understand the materials. Uh, the American high school ends at grade 12 near about 18 years old. And so having a score of 12 suggests that uh, you've completed a high school education essentially and have a reading level at, at, at that level. Anything above a 12 suggests that you would need a university level reading level. And so what do we see here? Um, aside from Bitmoji, all of the terms of service scored above 12, many of them well above 12, some of them reaching 14, 15, 16, almost 17. What does this mean? The terms of service are very complicated, right? Which again, if the goal is meaningful transparency, this is where you get this concern expressed. Well, it's just too complicated. And the privacy policies, while slightly less complicated, some of them uh, are reaching 15.7 and the 14s, most of them are above 12 as well. Another section, 
Persons should be notified, this is section 70 of the EU AI Act. Persons should be notified that they are interacting with an AI system. Information and notification should be provided in accessible formats. This suggests that for meaningful transparency, um, organizations should be doing a good job notifying people when they provide that clear and concise information and make sure that information is accessible to support engagement. But again, is self-regulation delivering? Our research emphasizes the problems of click wrap agreements. Does this look familiar? When we sign up for services and apps, we often see this click wrap. And what our content analyses reveals is that across many digital services, they demonstrate what we call a problematic agenda setting function where as you read from top to bottom, you notice a very appealing sign up button first and are and not as easily um, uh, notified about the boring links to policies that are below. And we find this sort of deceptive design, right? And I use this term purposefully, right? Uh, because much is being discussed about deceptive user interface designs these days and how they tend to, to um, privilege uh, companies and other organizations over the needs of users, right? A dece arguably a deceptive design like this, what we see is very prominent sign up buttons that distract your attention. They don't say agree or consent to notify people that a consent process is taking on. And so really what we find is that people are just rushing through and signing up and not actually realizing that they could engage. So is this the self-regulation that leads us to that meaningful transparency? This is a problem. And I'll go on to say we have another study, two studies, one of undergraduates and one of older adults, where we assessed through an experimental survey scenario, which I'd be happy to talk about more, engagement with a notice and consent process for a fake social network. And what we found when we asked people uh, why they rushed, the, the vast majority rushed through the online consent process we set up, what we found was that notice equals nuisance. People aren't looking for a privacy education or discussion when they access digital services. When they download an app, a banking app, they wanna do their banking. When they download a social media app, they want a social network. When they download a shopping app, they want to shop, et cetera, right? And so notifying, trying to notify people with click wraps that rush people through services in a context where people see privacy education and information about how an AI works as tangential to the reason that they're even on the app suggests a lot of problems with text-based forms of self-regulation you know, via privacy in terms of service policies that we've seen so far. And the click wraps that don't even get us to, to these um, policies. No wonder the biggest lie on the internet grows bigger every day. So what to do about this? As I mentioned, we're working on a new study to try and meet people where they are, watching videos, and using apps because people don't want to go off to some random website to read some boring privacy policy. And so we're following the Privacy Commissioner of Canada's guidelines for meaningful consent and perhaps uh, you know, adjustments uh, in uh, overseas uh, should, should follow these guidelines as well, if, if I can say so. What do they say for improving these problems that I've been talking about, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada? Well, Notice and consent processes need to be innovative and creative, meaning they have to be engaging, right? So that people will actually be interested in learning about AI and, and the risks, right? We're gonna explain these systems. We have to do so in a way that meets people where they are and gets them interested and con perhaps concerned. We can't just be giving this information to people when they sign up. Consent, and as a result, the transparency used to, to get us to meaningful consent needs to be dynamic and just in time. Again, not just at the beginning. We need to be communicating information to people at multiple points through their online engagements. And you must emphasize the consumer's perspective. Again, people are on TikTok watching videos. They're on Instagram looking at videos and pictures, right? So maybe the notice materials should not be text-based only. There should be videos. And so that's what we have been focusing on. And so what I'd like to do now in the chat is I'm gonna share an example of a PSA. Uh, we're at the rough cut phase, so please don't share it. It's just for you to watch today for a minute. It's only about 40 seconds long. A PSA that we're, and this is what we've been doing with the funding, right? 
that we're developing with undergraduate students here at York University, um, again, with funding from the OPC. And we're going to be testing these to see how they work. And it'd be great to get your feedback too. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. My recommendations are as follows. Less complicated notice materials, please. Uh, you know, focusing on text-based materials only is a problem. Uh, governments should be discouraging click wraps, discouraging deceptive designs we've seen in France. Keneal has been doing an excellent job, I would argue, finding companies uh, that are developing deceptive designs in problematic cookie consent scenarios because these deceptive designs rush and distract consent processes. And how do we meet people where they are to create more engaging consent processes? Perhaps invest in PSAs uh, to explain AI. And if the self-regulation isn't going to happen on its own, again, I would recommend fines to encourage that self-regulation. These are my references. Thank you for your time. Now I'm going to give the floor to uh, to Dr. Gaia Fiorinelli. Uh, she will be uh, presenting a paper on an acceptable risk uh, of AI and the role of criminal law, EU and Council of Europe compare. So please, uh, you can take the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. I shared my slides. I hope you can see and hear me. Thank you. Sorry for my voice, but I got the, the flu, so I'll try to do my best here. And um, yeah, and in my research, in the research I, I, I'm presenting here, um, I try to focus on this notion and I try to develop the notion of uh, unacceptable risks of AI uh, inside and outside the uh, draft AI Act um, by comparing uh, the EU and the Council of Europe as regulators that are currently developing uh, some provisions that in a wider perspective can be used to build a framework, a sort of a framework of a criminal punitive regulation of AI against uh, uh, what I call unacceptable risks or unacceptable harm. And I should start, I need to start by explaining why criminal law. Because from um, the, the, the interplay between AI and criminal law, uh, has traditionally been studied um, at first with regard um, to the use of AI tools in criminal justice, for instance, for uh, uh, recidivism and predictive policing, and on the other hand, with regard to the um, possible attribution of criminal liability for traditional harm caused by AI, and for instance, also the problem of the possible attribution to criminal liability to the same AI. But this is not the the, the, the focus that I will uh, develop in my presentation at that, that I'm developing in my research, since uh, my research question is quite different. Um, I'm working on a EU funded project named Cerex, uh, uh, in which we investigate from the perspective of criminal law, the topic of security and rights in cyberspace. And so in my research, I'm considering AI as a tool that can endanger or harm security and rights of individuals and society, and I'm asking whether uh, these harms um, can or should become relevant also for the perspective and from the perspective of criminal law as a sort of um, body of law that, um, at least in our continental tradition, is considered a field of law that comes into question where we need to protect uh, individuals and society from the main, the most relevant harms and risks that we perceive as unacceptable. And so in my research, I try to, to map and to compare models of criminal or otherwise punitive administrative liabilities specifically related to the deployment and use of AI as they're currently emerging at different regulatory levels and um, to prevent the specific AI arms and risks that are perceived as unacceptable. And I uh, want to stress that the, the focus of the research is not mainly on the harms and risks posed, posed by a possible malfunctioning of an AI, but mainly on the same use of AI and on the specific features of AI and possible uses that can be considered dangerous for society and individuals. And so the, 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 um, the, the object of my presentation and the goal of my research is to understand the role and scope of application of criminal punitive provisions in the more general framework of the regulation of AI um, that is currently under discussion. Um, 
And as just to anticipate my conclusion, I argue that in the current framework, we can indeed uh, find some provisions in this draft that all together we can use to build a sort of a framework of a punitive regulation of AI. And so by mm, drawing on this conclusion, I can answer to two additional research questions. And the first is, what risks and harm from AI to individuals and societies are effective and actually nowadays considered as unacceptable in all, at all these regulatory levels? And then to consider how is the structure of the resulting regulations and liability models? For instance, Professor Robert, the first, the previous, the previous um, speaker, uh, made reference to the, the the important the importance of fines in order to ensure compliance and to ensure protection of rights and so on. So. I will also um, say something about this. And then in order to uh, understand the, the, this, this main framework, um, through the analysis and comparison of these regu different regulatory drafts and initiatives uh, to uh, selecting the, uh, collecting the, the, the norms that are referring to unacceptable risks and harm of AI, I think that this will help to understand um, which are the uh, new uh, risks of harm to people and society that are specifically linked to AI. And we can also build a comprehensive picture of prohibited AI practices by bringing together not only this European regulation from which I started, but also then also national criminal laws, because as all um, the previous speaker mentioned, indeed, we need to consider also the existing existing law, for instance, as um, Susan Bennett said, the work on health and safety. And so we have a lot of different uh, regulatory uh, instruments that all come into question when we're talking about a sort of punitive regulation of AI. As for the methodology, I already said that I focus for now on the EU and Council of Europe initiatives, considering them as the most relevant regulatory initiatives concerning AI at the moment for my European perspective, but they should be obviously complemented by national, they could be complemented by national legislation since we're talking about punitive criminal law, and we need also to consider them in a more global perspective. And also I decided to focus both on provision explicitly labeled as criminal and on provisions that however labeled as administrative could be arguably considered as a sort of criminal in nature, but are uh, however punitive since, since they entail prohibitions and penalties for certain AI uses and systems uh, that are justified uh, at the policy level um, with the need to prevent an acceptable arm. And a sort of disclaimer, uh, all the following consideration are obviously based on drafts and working documents, policy statements, and so on, because we do not have any uh, specific reference uh, currently into force, but um, this is the first reference, and I know that may maybe they will uh, subject to change. That being said, of course, we, we need to start from the AI Act, since Article 5 of the AI Act is the first reference and of the notion of, um, of this notion of unacceptable risks of AI. We need to say that even if it is not criminal in itself, this provision, it is meaningful also from my perspective and for the perspective of my research insofar as it conceptualizes for the first time in a novel way the impact of AI on the person since in this regulation, uh, since uh, its first release, we find uh, the conceptualization and the, the, the vision that possible harm, material or immaterial, can come from AI uh, as they can harm public interest and rights of individuals protected by EU law in a way that is so unacceptable that should be prohibited. And then in the premises of this draft regulation, we find this, uh, we, we, we find that they say that we need to tailor the type and content of rules to the intensity and scope of the risks that AI system can generate. And when the intensity and the scope of the risk is so serious that they can endanger, for instance, they can cause harm to public interest, rights protected by law, and specifically human dignity, freedom, equality, and so on, the, the model of regulation is the one of the, the prohibition. And in the case of non-compliance, we have 
the provision of penalties that are administrative fines, but they should be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive as it occurs for uh, criminal, san criminal sanction or otherwise punitive sanctions. And so I have not the time here now to uh, deepen the, the, the notion of unacceptable risks and prohibited practices. I just wanted to stress how it can be the starting point of a different perspective on the regulation of AI from a, from a sort of a punitive uh, perspective. Also in the 2023 amendment made by the parliament, we found this stress on the notion of harm um, that is expanded through the new definition of prohibited practices that are even wider because we make reference to manipulative, deceptive techniques, exploitative practices, and also a a along the list of uses of AI for surveillance, identification, predictive policing, facial rec recognitions, and so on, that from the perspective of the EU Parliament should be banned. And so it is really interesting since the ban is now not only referred to private uses or uses for economic purposes, but also um, as regards public authorities, safeguards, for instance, are not sufficient, but the structure of the of the rule is the complete ban. So I found it really interesting and uh, as, a, as a perspective that needs to be developed also from the uh, criminal law, also from the criminal law perspective. That being said, uh, also the notion of high risk system in the AI Act is indeed uh, relevant in my in my research, since uh, AI high risk AI systems are considered to pose uh, themselves unacceptable risks to important union public interest, and also in this area, the harm coming from AI for individuals or society is conceptualized in a novel way since they recognize how AI can harm health, safety, fundamental rights, democracy, or even the environment, as also the previous speakers mentioned. And so uh, we have here a different regulatory model since uh, there are some mandatory requirements that need to be in, adopted in order to ensure that high-risk AI systems do not pose an acceptable risk. So we do not have a ban. We have a sort of a list of mandatory requirements and we have penalties for non-compliance in the form of administrative fines, not just for the case of an incident that occurs and so on, but just for the mere non-compliance with the adoption of these mandatory requirements. So we have a sort of of, uh, of a really anticipated uh, perspective on the prevention of such risks. And as regards the same high risk systems, we also have in the, in the proposals of the AI Act, the definition of a serious incident and in the list of serious incidents that need to be reported to uh, authorities and surveillance authority, we, we can see that we have a list of injuries, for instance, the death of a person, a serious damage to a person else, that I think should be of interest also of national criminal laws, for instance. And so this uh, overall uh, building of a, uh, of a comprehensive picture on this punitive regulation of AI uh, is really interesting as it can also help in um, um, having a, a wider perspective and trying to um, avoid overlapping, for instance, and to uh, have a, a comprehensive perspective of all the punitive consequences when uh, some something occurs related to AI. But um, at the EU level, the I AI Act is not this, the only source we can refer to when we uh, are trying to understand which are the unacceptable risks related to AI, since in some policy documents we can, for instance, find a reference to the fact that AI should be considered also through the lenses of the Directive 2013 number 40 uh, on attacks against information systems that provides for criminal penalties against some attacks. And it is now under discussion about the possibility of maybe um, interpreting or expanding this directive in, in order to consider um, cybersecurity and vulnerabilities of AI as specific problems that should be uh, addressed from the, this specific perspective of sub cyber crime, so to say. But it's not. Uh, also, for instance, the Europol uh, released uh, a paper uh, on ChatGPT and large language, language models in which they said that developers, but also law enforcement authorities, 
need to take into account the range of criminal use cases of this AI. And so they are sort of developing a notion of a criminal use of AI that should be considered in preventive terms from developers and from companies that are releasing AI applications. And so we have this other block in our uh, comprehensive view from the perspective of criminal law. Also, in the security strategy of EU, we need to mention that AI is listed among the key enabling technologies with military applications that poses risks for the EU. So from the perspective of criminal, but maybe also international criminal law, we can find another block that can help us in building this sort of uh, all-encompassing punitive regulation of AI. But coming to the Council of Europe, also the Council of Europe and the Committee on Crime Problems developed um, a, a comprehensive view and decided to stress the need to focus on serious harm and unacceptable behavior in this case, not unacceptable harm, but unacceptable behavior related to the use and to the development of AI systems. Since the, the study of the European Committee on Crime Problems is limited, uh, this was limited at the first time on the topic of automated driving uh, as a case study for AI. The harm that is taken into consideration is, um, for instance, the case in which an AI system kills or injures uh, a human. So we have a sort of physical material dimension of the potential harm, not just the wider perspective that we can find in, in the AI Act. But I found it really interesting in this study of the Council of Europe, how they highlighted that the application of criminal law to AI is, should not be considered just from a descriptive point of view, so just to study how the existing criminal law should be applied to AI and to its, its features, but has an inherently normative component because we need to decide also from the perspective of criminal punitive law uh, which risks we want to accept in order to benefit from AI and which risks we consider unacceptable. And so in the same feasibility study on a future Council of Europe instrument on artificial intelligence and criminal law, uh, they stress how the decision about what risks we ought to take is eventually a political one involving the whole society. And so uh, it, it shows how uh, the need to establish a common international framework for a substantive rules of criminal law of AI has, has a, a inherently and fundamental political uh, consistency. I'm coming just to the conclusion, just to not run out of time, uh, just to mention that we have now a framework document, but as we can uh, understand from the agenda and reports of the European Committee on Crime Problems, we are uh, waiting for a recommendation that is expected to be released as the output of the, this work. A first framework document was really interesting since they listed a sort of a list of offenses that we need that needed to be uh, provided for in criminal laws specifically related to AI, and they were specifically considering offenses related to AI um, intelligent systems in violating obligations regarding design. So uh, the perspective is similar, I think, to the perspective of high risk system in the AI Act, since we have penalties for non compliance with obligations uh, regarding design, safety, and so on, but also specific norms as regards tampering of AI systems. And so a sort of perspective on the, on the cyber crime, <laughs> on the cyber crime side. And so this um, uh, wider notion of harm that can um, come from a tampering of AI system and can be different from the cyber crimes against computer system, for instance. And this is the, 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 the last slide. In the same uh, documents of the Council of Europe, we can find reference to unacceptable risks and criminal regulation of AI, also in other documents and drafts. Uh, in the framework convention, indeed, in the last version, we do not find any more uh, reference to harm or damage, but just definition of principles, rights, and general obligations. But for instance, the Cybercrime Convention Committee listed among its objective and actions for 2022-23, also a sort of revision of the Budapest Convention to ensure the relevance of the criminal law provisions as regards AI system and, for instance, hacking of AI system and its specific harm. And also the group of state against corruption, uh, 
stated that they have an ongoing study on the risks of AI specifically related to corruption and so measures need to be taken to prohibit the use of software algorithms with corrupt intent. And so we can say that in this overall picture, I was very quick, but I hope to um, uh, analyze more in deep this, all these uh, topics in my paper and re future research. We have many different approaches to unacceptable risks and harm related to AI, but each of these approaches I think is meaningful for criminal law, not just in descriptive, but mainly in normative terms. And um, we have a range of prohibited, punished, and unacceptable harms and behaviors related to AI that uh, can be considered as specific AI, AI, AI harm, new AI harm that um, are specifically related to the features and um, possible uses of AI. But we have also the need to expand existing criminal law frameworks to AI practices, and also the need to conceptualize AI misuse as an autonomous source of harm that maybe uh, also developers and companies should consider. And so uh, I think that we need to uh, coordinate this regulatory preventive initiative and frameworks and national criminal law. But just to conclude, I, I argue that um, we can see and we can find an actual and meaningful role also for criminal law in, regulator, in regulating artificial intelligence and in protecting individuals and society from harm. Thank you. I hope I'm in time and I'm here for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very well on time. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, very, very uh, insightful as well. Uh, thank you for like helping us understand uh, what is uh, what is covered by unacceptable risk. And also like also again, because uh, for this word there yesterday, like making us realize that with AI, we have to rethink some concept and adapt. Um, so now I just want to give the floor to our discussant uh, so she can uh, give you some, some comments, uh, insight. Uh, so we can do that maybe for a few minutes and see uh, if you have any question from, from the audience. So please, uh, Judith, you have, you have the floor. Thank you. thank you. And thank you so much for these presentations. It's um, a privilege to be part of this. And I just have learned so much in, 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 from both presenters so and very practical examples as well like so much to think about so I'll probably be following up with you separately as well I'll try and contain myself to a few minutes just with a a few themes that emerge for me uh, probably one general question for both of you and then we'll see if there's anything from the from the audience as well so I, and I think this fitted this panel fits you know connects very closely to the first panel that we heard this morning and especially some of the things that Susan Bennett mentioned as well around mechanisms and concepts around transparency so I think these dominant themes were obviously transparency and, and risk in our two presentations that we've just heard, um, which are obviously central components to the European Parliament agenda on, 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 on the Act and, and thinking more broadly as well. Um, and, I, and I thank Jonathan for drawing our attention to the specific uh, aspects of the Act that relate to transparency and raising questions around you know, where they should apply, not only in the high risk context, for example, and thinking about what does meaningful transparency look like. Um, so it's all very well to use this metaphor that we, we speak about so freely, but thinking about how does that actually lead to achieving meaningful accountability and what does public participation look like in that context? And that's something that I've been really interested in. Like this year I've had an affiliation to the organisation Connected by Data, which has really made that its central mission, which is thinking about how do you involve the public with data governance and involve communities in decisions about data uses and technology uses. So Jonathan, if you're not aware of them, I'd really like to put you in touch because I think they would be really, really interested in, in, in your work. Um, so I'd scribbled down so many things, but I'm just trying to limit myself in terms of time. Um, so yeah, so I don't need to repeat sort of the ways in which transparency are, are, are woven into the act, but I guess we're thinking about the ways in which citizens may have rights to make complaints about AI systems and receive explanations of decisions based on high risk AI systems that affect their rights, um, as well as sort of the transparency requirements. Um, it, you know, for example, for generative AI, I think disclosing the fact that the content was generated by AI, for example. Um, just to also flag, because obviously we've been talking about the European context and uh, everything that ha that's happening with EU Act. For us, those of us that are working and living in the in the UK, it doesn't it, at the moment there doesn't seem to be much appetite for taking on a on uh, um, 
if you're putting legislation on the table, that's not the noises that are coming out from the AI summit that we heard um, earlier this month. And our minister for AI and IP um, said more recently that there'll be no UK law on AI in the short term because the government was concerned that heavy handed regulation could curb industry growth. And I just wanted to emphasize that as a theme, like the, the role of business and commercial interests here as well. I thought maybe perhaps pertinent to both the presentations that we've heard, this emphasis on pro-innovation in the context of developing regulation and just to think about that as how that might be framing and shaping countries' um, approaches to AI regulation. So my general question was really about mechanisms for transparency, I think. Um, Jonathan gave us a few examples of the way in which we might achieve more meaningful transparency and better involve the public and give people um, better, uh, sort of engaging with them in the ways that they're actually using me uh, media via video, for example. Um, so I think my question for Jonathan would be about yeah, how do we avoid this deceptive design that you des described? Like what of these approaches you've, you've recommended? What has the most potential and and also, how do we address the question about people's scepticism about public participation and data governance? I think, you know, in the discussions I've been involved in, there is a bit of pushback. There's sort of a scepticism about people wanting to be educated or whether there's actually a possibility of doing that. So I'd just be interested to hear a little bit more on that. And then on Gaia's presentation, you know, you gave, you gave us such a wonderful and rich account uh, in the European Committee context and thinking about this in the context of the criminal law. And I know you didn't so directly talk about transparency mechanisms, but I just wondered if you might say something on the role of public participation in that context and this question of transparency mechanisms, how that's relevant to assessing risk and regulating AI in the context of criminal law, um, if that's not too much of a shoehorning in of my particular and personal interest. So that's my general question. And I don't know if any have come in from the audience as well. So this is our moment to begin the keynote panel for our second day. I just want to welcome everyone back. And as I was just saying to Philip, one of our speakers, we had two really excellent academic panels already this morning on AI law and practice fit for purpose and the EU AI Act and other related frameworks. So if you're just joining us, we will have recordings of those morning panels and they'll be publicly available after the event. But now that we are all here, I am very excited to moderate and to introduce you to our very distinguished keynote panel that will conclude our two-day conference on international policy and perspectives. I'll just quickly run through the format of the panel, which is that we will each have presentations by all of our speakers, and then hopefully we'll just have <laughs> chance for a panel discussion if any of our speakers would like to respond to any of the points raised by other speakers and then we'll open it up for Q&A with the audience um, with all the time allowing that we have and without further ado I will begin with our first speaker who is so impressively joining us from the other side of the world so it's rather it's rather late in the day there for Jeremiah. So we're, we're, we're very grateful for everyone who has joined us across various time zones today. So a special thank you for all of those where it's quite early in the morning or it's a little bit late in the evening. Many thanks. So our first speaker is Professor Jeremiah Adam, Adams Prassel. Jeremiah is Professor of Law at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of Magdalen College, Oxford. His research focuses on technology, innovation policy, and the future of work in the European Union and also beyond. He's published several books, but one in particular has been very influential, Humans as a Service, published by Oxford University Press, which explores the promise and perils of work in the gig economy across the world. It was awarded the 2019 St. Petersburg Private Law Prize and has been translated into multiple languages. Jeremiah's research on innovation policy and labor market re regulation is frequently drawn on by governments and international organizations, including the European Commission, the International Labor Organization, the OECD, and his work has also been cited by various courts, policymakers, and news organizations across multiple jurisdictions. Jeremiah, we're delighted that you're here to join us, and my, I understand that you're going to be speaking about AI-based systems uh, within the employment context. Thank you, Nora, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to join this panel. It's a great honour to be in such um, illustrious company um, this evening or morning, depending on where we are. Um, what I will do 
think about in my eight minutes is really two main tensions I see when we're faced with the regulation of new technologies. And I'll try and use the employment context as an illustration of that. But um, one thing I'd be really interested as well in exploring with my fellow panelists is the extent to which those things can generalize. Now, the two tensions that I think we face in regulating new technologies are, first of all, one between can we develop existing laws? Can we take existing norms and adapt them to the new systems we're facing? Or do we need completely new rules? Is this something that is so fundamentally distinct that actually only new rules will be able to protect citizens, protect fundamental rights? The second tension that's in a way related but quite distinct is do we want to regulate AI and other emerging technologies in an omnibus fashion? Do we want to have one set of norms that apply across all sectors? Or is it actually sectoral regulation? Do we want to say that AI and consumer protection is very different from AI and financial services, is very different from AI in the world of work? So what I want to do with my uh, eight minutes is really try and explore a bit those two tensions. Now, two important disclaimers before I get there. First of all, those tensions aren't new. I think we face those tensions whenever we're trying to look at new phenomena and how the law should respond to them. But I think there is a fundamental difference insofar as the stakes are much higher now. So whilst in a sense, we're not looking at something new in terms of the regulatory choices, in terms of what's involved and broad implications, actually the stakes are pretty high. The second thing I want to emphasize is that even though I portray them as tensions, we don't necessarily need to resolve them. We don't necessarily need to say we're only going to either have new laws or use existing norms. Indeed, what um, the, the work I've been doing with my team suggests is that we can carefully do both, right? So we both want to evolve new norms and we want to have a sense of what are the new regulatory gaps. Similarly, we might want to have certain standards that apply across the board, but then we might want to apply them more specifically in specific sectors. So even though I'm presenting them as tensions, I think that's an important caveat, I suppose. They're not necessarily things that need to be um, reconciled, but we can sort of live somewhere along that spectrum or even think about a combination of them. So let me talk briefly a bit more about the first tension. Can existing laws cope with this or do we need new rules? Now, of course, by now, the harms that we potentially see from AI systems have been very widely documented. That's harms that includes things like bias, discrimination, harms that include broader issues surrounding privacy, surrounding surveillance, surrounding information asymmetries. And it's important to think that when we think about existing rules, the source of the harm isn't necessarily relevant for the legal norms. So whether you get hit by a drunk driver or you get hit by a self-driving car, but from the perspective of the victim, actually the harm is the same. Now, from a jurisprudential perspective, in a senior common room, of course, we could have very interesting discussions about this. But when we think about the norms, the harm could be the same. So, for example, together with my team, um, I've been working, thinking about discrimination law. Um, lots of people, including uh, Philip, who's uh, on this panel, have done really, really amazing work on discrimination law, thinking through how the European uh, key could apply discrimination law, one thing we've been suggesting is that we could push it even further and say it's not just indirect discrimination that applies, but possibly even the law on direct discrimination, which of course in reality would then lead to a pretty much direct ban on the application of systems that fall within the scope of those norms. Similarly, again, data protection law has thrown up really interesting new avenues. So from an employment law perspective, when you are faced with litigating against major gig economy platforms, you of course have to spend the first five years litigating all the way up to the Supreme Court and back to work out whether an individual is a worker or not. The answer is clear, they are workers, but various technical legal issues make that more difficult. Now using data protection, and we see this in litigation in the Netherlands at the moment against Uber and Ola, completely sidesteps that question. Because rather than saying I was unfairly dismissed, as an employee and therefore I need to establish that status. If you frame your claims in Article 22 GDPR claim and say, you just took an automated decision that significantly affected my contractual rights. Well, there's no doubt at all that any Uber driver is a data subject. And so she therefore doesn't have to spend those first five years combating um, various questions of employment law. So I think it's really important to point out that there are real genuine use cases for existing norms and under no circumstances must we fall into the trap of thinking just because the technology is new, 
all the existing norms can go out of the window. That is absolutely not the case. And I think it's really, really important for us to keep making that point and keep emphasizing. Now, at the same time, and remember, I'm talking about tensions, at the same time, there are, of course, gaps. And I think what we need to do with new legislation and thinking about new forms of regulation is very carefully explore what the gaps are, thinking about what are the gaps and then try to assess those gaps. Not necessarily technology, but rather thinking about what are the specific gaps. So, for example, with my team, um, we've recently published a blueprint for regulating algorithmic management, the deployment of AI in the workplace. And we think very specifically about what are the gaps in existing norms that AI now triggers and what could we do specifically to respond to those. And that brings me to my second tension, which is, do we want to have an omnibus regulatory regime for AI or any new emerging technology? Or do we want to say, actually, we need to look at specific sectoral regulation? Again, this is not a new tension. So when you look at the history, um, Dr. Halifam Abra, my, uh, one of my postdocs who works specifically on data protection, has done a lot of really interesting work on this. When you look at the history of data protection legislation in both Germany and the EU subsequently, actually, there was a real debate for a long time whether you wanted to have sectoral regulation or overall regulation. So the fact that the GDPR regulates data across all different fields is not a given at all. And in fact, is not at all the only option that was explored. And you look at Article 88 of the GDPR, for example, which is an opening clause of sorts for the employment context. And that shows you the clear traces of this realization that maybe regulating data protection in different contexts might require different norms. And so in that regard, I think when we look at the AI Act, which Nora has already mentioned in her introduction, there's potentially an issue there with its very broad trying to regulate the technology rather than trying to regulate its implications in particular fields. And again, I, I must emphasize that it's very clear that AI is absolutely the sort of thing that needs to be regulated at the European level. So me being slightly critical of the AI Act should not be taken at all as a suggestion that this shouldn't be regulated at the EU level. But I think potentially one of the issues of the AI Act is its attempt to identify all these different high risk areas from the deployment of public services through to employment and the world of work, and then try to apply the same set of norms, the same set of standards to that particular approach. I think what's difficult then is that even though yes, in general, identifying these areas as high risk deployment areas is important and is correct, but what becomes difficult then is prescribing the solutions. This one thing that stands out in EU law in particular is that actually different areas in the treaties have very different approaches, both constitutionally and in terms of the substantive norms of addressing those problems, of resolving them. In the employment context, for example, we'd be thinking very much about involving the social partners in developing norms, in setting standards. In other contexts, we might have rules about protecting small businesses, etc. Etc. So I think the real challenge in terms of the omnibus versus sectoral is that with AI, we can't just regulate it as an overarching technology. I understand that Philip is about to tell us more about the regulation of generative AI and the most recent developments. But actually, I think what we see by these new proposals that are now being added on in terms of various forms of new levels of gen AI models, that just shows that it tech-focused regulation isn't necessarily a way of succeeding because you end up chasing the technology and trying to have norms rather than think about the harms that ensue. To end with positive news, I think if you want a case study of really how to do this, the Platform Work Directive, which is currently also undergoing its trilogues, actually is a very tailored instrument that specifically identifies the dangers in the work context and then comes up with very clear and tailored solutions for that. So specific provisions on algorithm management in the platform context, I think that's the way forward, looking at each sector, identifying the problems, and then responding to them with regulatory solutions. But to conclude, as I say, these are tensions, the answers aren't clear cut in either way. We may well have some horizontal norms that then filter through into the sectoral regulation. We should definitely have both existing laws and recognize the fact that new laws. So just because the tensions, doesn't mean we need to choose, we just need to carefully navigate that trade-off. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jeremiah. That was a fantastic introduction to the developments in these areas at the EU level. And I really appreciated your point regarding the tensions that already exist with respect to regulating emerging technologies and that we should acknowledge that these have pre-existed, for instance, the EU's digital strategy and all the various proposals and legal frameworks they're in. And I particularly like your point as well about the tensions to be to be reconciled in terms of having general frameworks covering all kinds of different systems and processing and then taking a sector specific approach and now we've seen that in train before with the gdpr and having say the electronic communications directive of 2002 and the law enforcement directive as well so they're taking the principles of the gdpr applying them in sector specific contexts But I think what we've seen in terms of challenges and in light of what you also mentioned as well with regard to different areas, say, of employment and how those tensions and general challenges apply across different areas is that there's a tension in terms of how we reconcile all these different frameworks to work together so that they're all working in a harmonious approach, which is particularly important at the EU level, because we've already got, as you mentioned, um, in terms of the GDPR, specific derogations for particular sectors to regulate. So having that focus on greater harmonization amongst all these different EU level instruments, it becomes more important than ever now in terms of the legal complexity, but also the technical. So, so much to discuss and so many questions after such a fantastic start, but I will move on to our other wonderful uh, academic who has much expertise in this field, as Jeremiah already mentioned, which is Professor Philip Hacker. He holds the Chair for Law and Ethics of the Digital Society at the European New School of Digital Studies, ENS, at the European University, Virginia Frankfurt, at Oder. In 2021, he was a research fellow at the Weizenbaum Institute for the Connected Society Berlin. Prior to joining ENS, he held several academic posts, including as an AXA postdoctoral fellow, pardon me, at the Faculty of Law at Humboldt University of Berlin, and as a Max Weber fellow at the University at the European University Institute. His research focuses, as Jeremiah just mentioned, on the intersection of law and technology, including emerging technologies, for instance, the impact of AI, the Internet of Things, on various areas of law, consumer law, privacy, anti-discrimination law, the regulatory constitutional regime. And he often collaborates with computer scientists and mathematicians, especially on questions of explainable AI and algorithmic fairness. He regularly advises national and EU legislatures, regulatory agencies and industry. And today he will be speaking to us about generative AI foundation models and frontier AI regulation. Philip, wonderful to have you whenever you're ready. Great, thank you so much, Nora, for uh, joining uh, all of us, bringing all of us together, I'd say, uh, for this wonderful panel. And um, thanks so much, Jeremiah, for your introductory remarks. I'd actually love to just uh, concentrate on what you said and just start up uh, with a discussion. And I think we'll do that after uh, afterwards uh, for some time. But just to mention like two other tensions that <clears throat> came to mind when I listened to yours. One was um, temporality. And this is something that uh, was implicit also in your remarks, as in the fact that we know that t- technology on the one hand and the interpretation of the law on the other hand are changing, of course, at a rapid pace at this moment. So how can we somehow navigate these tensions of differential speeds that has plagued, I guess, technology regulation for such a long time? I have some ideas to that. Um, And uh, a second one that I would be also uh, quite intrigued in pursuing is the question of um, whether there is also a tension within the concept of harms in the sense of there might be harms not only from using AI in certain contexts, but also from not using AI in certain contexts. Um, And uh, to think about the medical domain, for example, and those are harms that sometimes are uh, not yet uh, in regulatory terms adequately taken into account perhaps, and would be interesting to tease that out and how that can be factored into existing and future regulation. Anyways, I will try to use this a uh, great introduction of or talk of Jeremiah as a springboard toward a let's say a 
case study, I can't say deep dive in eight minutes or seven or whatever I have left, um, to talk a little bit about foundation models. And I should uh, note at the outset, full disclosure, that I'm currently quite heavily involved in these uh, trilogue negotiations. I'm uh, advising the German government, also the European Parliament on this. Uh, the recent initiative of the German government was not my idea, and I'm vehemently opposed to this. If you're following the news just a little bit, there has been quite some upheaval, and the, the uh, negotiations have grown to a certain halt uh, concerning foundation models. So I want to explore two questions here. First is, uh, should we regulate foundation models at all? And that is a question that Jeremiah has also very aptly brought up in the sense of, should we focus on certain technologies or not just you know regulate um, more in a technology neutral? And then the second question following up on this is, uh, if we do think that some kind of regulation is appropriate for foundation models, um, what, how could that look like? What would that be? And I would like to uh, add some remarks in this context on the sustainability dimension, which I think is currently quite um, heavily under overlooked. So let's start with um, the question of should we regulate foundation models at all? And as you all know, foundation models are these large, uh, most potent models, such as GPT-4, BARD, or uh, Aleph Alpha's Luminous, that are developed mainly by US co uh, corporations, uh, but also in China and to a certainly lesser extent in Europe. Um, so I think um, the current situation is such that there was a proposal by the European Parliament, according to which regulation uh, was supposed to cover foundation models in a two-tiered approach, a multiple-tiered approach. And um, then last Friday, just one week ago, a uh, non-paper was published by uh, Germany, France, and Italy, in which they heavily lobbied or advised against such an approach and opted for mere self-regulation. And ever since I've been quite busy trying to tell uh, people in Germany and, and in other contexts that this is actually, I think, a very bad idea. And I am um, firmly convinced by the fact that we should regulate foundation models, even though it is a specific technology for two reasons. First one is technical. If you think about foundation models, the way they work is actually a new infrastructure, like a new operating system. You've seen that OpenAI has now opened its, um, its app store and you can actually build um, as a developer, lots of apps based on these um, foundation models. And so from a technical perspective, this is really a new infrastructure. And some of the things that you do not fix at the infrastructure level are simply technically close to impossible to fix downstream. So think of, you know, bias. If you have uh, trained this on two on 20 billion data points, which is common to do, um, and uh, it just so happens that most of your examples were from middle-aged white men, such as myself, there will be quite heavy bias baked into this system. And we can debate at length whether this is then uh, indirect or just direct discrimination uh, with Jeremiah's excellent points on the recent paper that he published on you know, um, arguing for more direct uh, discriminatory approach. But the problem is that uh, all of the downstream providers won't be able to get this out anymore. If you do some fine tuning, you know, now what, no way you're going to get around these 20 uh, billion skewed data points that you had upstream. A second example is safety layers. So uh, as you know, these systems are trained with reinforcement learning with, uh, with human feedback. And much of these, many of these safety layers are just impossible to implement at the same level of rigorosity uh, technically downstream. So basically you need it upstream, otherwise it's technically infeasible or just prohibitively costly. And the second point is economic. And that is, uh, I think, even more critical because the push by Germany and, um, the, and France and Italy mostly comes from an industrial policy perspective. They want to protect those uh, wannabe champions in the, in the kind of European nascent uh, space such as Mistral, Aleph Alpha, Nionic, just these four to five companies that aspire to become world leaders, uh, although they haven't shown yet uh, that they can actually do this, aspire to be world leaders amongst foundation models, providers. Now, those are certainly important companies, but the point is that it's highly inefficient to focus or to leave them out of the equation, because what you don't fix upstream has to be fixed a thousand times by all the different downstream providers in the same way. And those are actually the ones that are not only on aggregate will be a burden, which would greater cost, but which, as I just said, you know, from a technical level, will have a much harder time doing that. And in fact, it's it's uh, it overlooks the uh, fact that in Europe, 
most of the AI system and AI companies that we have are not foundation model providers. They are doing work that's outside of the foundation model space, be it, for example, with traditional convolutional neural networks in medical AI, or be it in secondary level applications uh, based on foundation models. So I think economically, it's just absolutely breathtakingly wrong and inefficient to leave foundation model providers out of the equation. And uh, this is a point that we're trying to you know, press with all of the policymakers at the moment, and we'll see if that uh, brings uh, any change in the discourse. There are some, uh, some signs of hopes um, that I've uh, received in the last few days, but we'll see where this goes to. Um, the second point then, if we say that uh, from a technical and um, economic perspective, it does make sense to focus on foundation models because they are foundational and they're certainly here to stay at least for a few years, um, I would suggest. Um, what exactly is it that we should then bake into this um, regulation? And here, just very briefly, I think we need, uh, and this is something we've tried to publish in, in an article very early on, it's called Regulating ChatGPT, we need a multiple layered approach. And one of these layers, and this goes precisely to what Jeremiah said, is a general layer that applies to all foundation models as minimum requirements. Those minimum requirements would include cybersecurity, AI safety, data governance, and I suggest um, sustainability questions. And then we can, based on this, have more specific sectorial duties based on whether you use this, uh, you know, for to write a birthday card, in which case nothing else really applies, or you use it for a candidate screening and employment law, then of course you have employment law duties, or you use this in a hospital setting, and of course you're in the field of potentially medical device regulation. Other things. Um, so what what is the point about sustainability? I think this is a vastly underaddressed issue, uh, despite the fact that there is a large uh, community, a growing community in computer science that has pointed out uh, the vast water and GHG emissions, um, uh, water consumption and GHG emissions uh, foundation models. So for example, there's a new study that shows that uh, that was actually um, covered uh, by the New York Times um, that shows that in the year, by the year 2027, uh, foundation models and AI system uh, systems in general will likely have the um, impact the GSG emissions of the country of Argentina. And hence, I think it is high time because this is really, this curve is going straight upward. It is high time to think about how we can tackle this. And in the in last minute, let's say, I just want to sketch out two uh, scenarios here that tie in very nicely with what Jeremiah said. The first one is to use existing regulation and namely the GDPR, just like in the other scenario, in the Uber case, where I think the GDPR can deliver nice and quick results. Why this? The GDPR has problems with conceptualizing third party relationships because so far it has been understood mainly as a, as a regulation between a data, um, uh, data say, controller and a data subject. However, there are certain rules and concepts such as legitimate interest that we can, um, or, um, um, or, or other frameworks such as the, data, um, the right to erasure that we can actually try to integrate and look at from an environmentally informed perspective. So for example, we can say that if there is too much of a, an excessive amount of um, environmental harm being done by a certain data processing operation, this could contribute to an understanding of this being an illegitimate purpose that is being um, pursued. Or we could even say that if certain, the exercise of certain rights, individual rights, um, lead to uh, a retraining of the model or the necessity of data processing operations that uh, cause environmental costs that are out of proportion with the request, then there might be need to tailor these rights more narrowly or think about them more narrowly. And the second point that I want to stress here, and I'm uh, coming to the end really, is that we need new policy proposals, and that would be more transparency. That's difficult to realize on a technical level, but we really need to work on this. We need sustainability impact assessments, which is something that the AI used to contemplate, and I'm quite afraid that this might now be thrown out of the window. And finally, I think we have to talk seriously about whether we want to expand the European um, uh, emissions trading system, which so far focuses on, you know, old high impact technologies such as um, aviation, maritime transport, and whatever steel furnaces, whether we don't want to expand this toward covering AI related processes, which I think would be high time and an urgent and nice extension of this. Main thanks for your uh, attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
Thanks so much, Philip. That really was a, a tour de force update of both the regulation, but also very cutting edge policy developments, even including the leaked paper regarding various um, leanings towards a self-regulatory approach to foundation models, which you've made your position very, very clear on. I think you raised some very significant points that also complement what Jeremiah mentioned earlier on in terms of harmonizing the regulation of these different frameworks. And I thought it was very important that you outlined the normative reasons as to why there should be regulation of foundation models. I, for want of being devil's advocate, I have to say previously in my own research in the past, you know, I've always uh, been a strong advocate of um, impact assessments and data protection impact assessments, um, for instance, and also fundamental rights impact assessments. We had some really fascinating conversations yesterday, focusing on the fact that once foundation models become accessible, they're accessible within a global context. And the culture of regulation and governance that's much more developed in certain jurisdictions, that's very much not the case in certain countries that don't have a very robust rule of law or governance system, for instance. So there was a very interesting debate about what would be the most important ex ante and ex post safeguards that we could put in place. Now, just because there have been difficulties with these safeguards does not mean that we abandon them wholesale. And this goes back again to Jeremiah's point about the tensions we have, which also enforcement is very much one of them. But again, so many questions, so many fantastic points, but I will move on for, to now. Uh, for our third speaker, and um, there's a great segue there in terms of the reference of enforcement, as our third speaker is Fanny Kuder, and she joins us from the EU Data Protection Regulators Office, the Office of the European Data Protection Supervisor, the EDPS. She is the EDPS's sector head for what is arguably most one of the most important, but also most challenging areas of data protection enforcement. And this is the area for supervision of freedom, security and justice. And previously, she worked as a researcher and specialized in privacy and surveillance areas of policy at KU Leuven University in Belgium. And today she will be talking to us about AI tools with a clear impact on the right to privacy, the role of data protection, and particularly, again, uh, this goes back to points raised by Philip, the latest related developments on the EU AI Act, and also specifically the regulation of high-risk AI. Fanny, you're very welcome. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Honora. Thank you for the invitation to uh, to participate to this uh, really a great panel. Um, I, I will be talking today a bit about uh, use of AI uh, in parts of the right of privacy in the field of law enforcement, which is a, a different perspective and specific perspective. Um, I, I wanted to say to start um, building on what uh, Jeremy has uh, said in his first intervention and arguing for the specific uh, regulation. Uh, well, I, I'm a bit hesitant, I must say, but uh, by looking at what happens in the field of law enforcement, um, that's true that there is a need maybe to adjust some rules, but um, there is always a risk to have this specific regulation just um, downgrading, actually, the, the, the level of, of protection, which is granting uh, uh, the general level of protection. I think that we can see uh, this as well happening in the context of negotiation of the AI Act vis-a-vis -vis, um, the regulation of the law enforcement sector. I will say a, a few words uh, about that, that they were initially considered high risk and then we're st starting to put derogations, uh, uh, lowering down the, um, the safeguards. Um, so yeah, just uh, a general, uh, I just wanted to point at least at this risk uh, as well when you, you start going into a sector specific uh, derogation. Um, but yeah, let, let's me uh, come back to the, the topic of my, um, my uh, intervention. Uh, and I, I wanted to um, to say a few words, so uh, I say uh, importance of uh, right to private rights and data protection uh, when we talk about the use of AI by law enforcement. So what first come to mind, and this is maybe the most obvious example, and this has been at the center of all the debates, in particular in the context of the AI, is facial recognition. 
Should we ban the use of real-time uh, facial recognition because of its impact on the right to move anonymously in public spaces, the right to assembly, etc.? Um, it seems to well, we had back and forth, um, and I wanted to to um, add some hesitation. And and one week ago, we had this example in France, actually, where journalists just uncovered that the Ministry of Interior had, had acquired back in 2015 a facial recognition software. Um, and which was used by several law enforcement services, including municipalities, outside any regulated use, in secret, uh, as it, uh, they didn't inform the CNIL, which is the French Data Protection Authorities. So the software was used to track people uh, based on the color of their clothes, from what they say, the, to track ve vehicle and based of license plates through um, uh, video surveillance network. They claim uh, there was a facial recognition feature that they claim they didn't use. Um, but the Kenyan has opened an investigation to look into that. And I think it really shows that um, even if we're having this very important social debate, um, well, it seems that law enforcement authorities start using this facial recognition software even uh, to track people. Uh, and it's sneaking its way uh, in many other ways uh, as well, because we, we, we can see that it's uh, the collection of um, facial images is growingly uh, used and fostered in the context of criminal investigation, um, policies uh, also exchanging more and more facial images. We can, I'm thinking, for instance, uh, of the PROM2 framework uh, regulation on automated data exchange for police cooperation, which is now including at EU level, uh, which is now including the exchanges of facial uh, images. And uh, for, for, for processing all these images, we need AI to process and cross all uh, biometric information. And this is also happening in the context of border control. We have this uh, interoperability framework, which will now count of a module which will link all the information contained in the EU large scale databases. We're talking of this, CIS, EURDAC, ES, uh, Equistician, on the basis of biometric information, meaning both fingerprints and facial images. And again, AI will be supporting the underlying processing and cross matching with all the risks that this uh, entails. But um, law enforcement is also using AI in other fields, which uh, maybe have an impact which is less obvious uh, on the right to privacy and data protection. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's important to stress that in, in the context of the, uh, the, the ongoing discussion in the context of AI Act and the, the introducing of this filtering system, which, was, which would exempt a certain um, less impactful uh, AI system from uh, the obligation uh, linked to high risk uh, AI. And I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, machine learning tools used to extract relevant information from large and unstructured data sets. So um, these tools are used to support the work of the criminal analyst to turn unstructured data into structured data. What does this mean? That it means that they support this crucial task of labeling individual contained in a data set, unstructured data set, as suspect, victims, witness, contacts, or whatever. So um, this is one of the, the tool that we see, or one of the ground on which there could be um, an exemption to, to the obligation uh, for this high-risk AI system. Um, that's one of the examples given, well, when they say the AI model transform unstructured data into structured data. And this is uh, seen as a, a minor task, which does not uh, impact so much uh, uh, rights. Uh, and and I, I'm not sure we are able to, to fully grasp uh, the, the impact, even if it's to support a task which is usually done by criminal analysts. The impact of any error or mistake is, is huge on this individual, which are subject of uh, criminal investigation. Another example also, which made me less, uh, not so obvious in terms of impact on rights and freedom, is the use of AI to produce statistics uh, from large data set. And I'm thinking here in the context as well of the interoperability framework of the Central Repository for Reporting and Statistics, or CRRS, um, which will be used to identify significant patterns within the data. So we are talking about uh, the data content in this EU large-scale database, so VIS, 
uh, EES or ETIAS data about overstayers and, in, uh, and about people who have been refused entry uh, to the EU. Um, so this data will be um, anonymized and analyzed in order to statistics based on AI in order to uh, identify patterns. And the, the concern I have here, and so we're trying to remove um, as much or to lower the, the impact on the right of priority by anonymizing the data or providing statistics. And my concern that we this um, will produce results with apparent objectivity, and this result will be further used uh, for instance, to fit the creation of screening rules in the context of ETIAS, so um, a rule that will flag people uh, with uh, uh, risk in terms of security or irregular migration or in including uh, public health. And this will be the decision of authorization of entry into the EU territory. So my point here is that um, uh, we have many uh, examples of uh, uses of AI system where the impact, the direct impact on the right to privacy is less obvious, but still it relies on the processing of large amounts of uh, personal data with an impact on other fundamental rights, such as the right to non-discrimination, right to fair trial, right to effective remedies. And uh, I think that in these cases, the right of data protection will play a fundamental role as a gateway to protect other fundamental rights. And compliance with data protection rule will act as a first uh, safeguard, not the only one, but as a first uh, building block. Um, and so uh, to come to the AI Act, I think that the, the fact that um, because of this, uh, the fact that the, initially the AI Act, I mean, all the AI used for law enforcement and border control purposes was put under high risk. I think there was something very positive and necessary. Um, and because this would force developers and users, uh, after the amendment introduced by the European Parliament, to conduct this fundamental right impact assessments. Uh, identifying and mitigating uh, existing risk. Um, and um, I, I, I found the amendment introduced by the Parliament to extend this obligation to users particularly interesting, um, in particular because they will be called to put in place uh, as well governance measures to address this risk risk created by the specific circumstances of use. And I find the particularly interesting because it goes beyond an obligation to find technological fixes, I would say. Um, and I hope I think you, you can agree with me that fixing potential bias in AI system, uh, even if absolutely necessary, will not solve by itself the risk of non-discrimination or making AI system explainable will not ensure by itself a right to effective, to, to comply with the right to effective uh, remedies. Um, I have my reservation about the efficiency of this measure, but I think that's a, a good step. I mean, especially when we see the, the, the expense we have in, in terms of data protection impact assessment in the field of data protection, uh, we see how difficult this is for data controllers to adequately perform this data protection impact assessment in the sense of identifying risk um, which could have a broader impact on society or, or even on individual. This is, we can say, this is a very difficult exercise which requires, I think, which will require uh, time and, and some learning uh, as, as a society, how, how to, to go about that, um, as we generate uh, more knowledge. Um, and my, my, my concern, as I say, that this, this safeguard, which was initially introduced in the AI Act, are now being watered down through this uh, series of derogation, excluding some system, and also through the filtering system, um, which will, I mean, uh, it's from, from what uh, it's, 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 uh, what I've read on the tables and on the table right now, is that it's even the developer, the user, who will be in charge of defining whether um, the AI system, uh, which is uh, they are developing, would fall under this category of high risk, uh, and should be exempted from um, the, the obligation to do this fundamental right impact assessment or to, to, uh, to register, uh, to, to, list it, to be listed in the public register. Um, we have several grounds. I mean, this seems, when, when we read the, 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 the ground, as I say, I mean, this seems reasonable, but I'm a bit concerned that this um, new uh, filtering system, this new ground will be used as a, a, a backdoor to avoid the application of this uh, of the provision of the AI Act. 
Um, and I think I, I would just like to conclude that all this scale world seems particularly important to me in the field of law enforcement, because the use of AI might not only have an impact on fundamental rights, but more broadly, I think, in this category and on our democratic system. So um, that was my, um, I will stop with this uh, sentence. Thank you. Oh, for now, thank you so much. And wherever you are in the world, have a lovely rest of day or good evening. I see Jeremiah's had to drop off because it was very late on the other side of the world where he was. So thank you all and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.